Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Euripides' The Trojan Women, which is one of the greatest anti-war plays of all time. Um, I actually got to see a production and sort of be involved in a production of The Trojan Women uh, at, at West Virginia University a few years ago. Um, it's a lamentation play. Uh, and by that, I mean, basically, it doesn't necessarily function like a traditional tragedy where you have a sort of narrative arc of one character who starts out more or less admirable, admirable and then is brought down to destitution by fate. No, in this case, you have really four quarters of suffering. Um, so basically, this is this play is set in the period immediately after the destruction of Troy, recounted, for instance, in Homer's The Iliad. Um, and you have Hecuba, who was the queen of Troy, along with a number of female survivors of the Trojan War, who are waiting in what's essentially a concentration camp or a prison camp to be dispersed as slaves to the Greek victors. And essentially what happens is you have a series of catastrophes that befall the women. So the first one, for instance, is when um, Cassandra, who is a holy pros er, sorry, no, strike that, who is a holy prophetess, uh, whose virginity is consecrate to the, the gods, um, she, it, it, she is assigned to Agamemnon to basically be a sort of sex slave, concubine, mistress type figure. Um, and, and it's an interest, that's an, a really interesting interaction because Cassandra herself who's a fascinating figure, one of my, one of the most interesting figures, I think, in Greek mythology, because um, Cassandra is a prophet who is doomed always to speak the truth, but never to be believed. She prophesies that in going with Agamemnon, she will end up destroying the house of Agamemnon, which, as we know from things like uh, the Oris the Oresteia of Aeschylus is actually what happens. Um, but she's not believed. So Hecuba and the women see this as a great tragedy, a great insult to Trojan religion, which of course it is. Um, and so this is the kind of thing we have. We basically have these four major events that occur, each of which is detrimental to the women's hope. But, interestingly enough, that structure only works because hope is built up. So hope, a, a minor hope, a, a flickering of hope, occurs in each instance, and then it's snuffed out. And it's really, I mean, structurally, it's a brutal play in that sense. Um, but if we look, for instance, at... Um, I think it's the first choral dialogue, the second strophe and antistrophe. The chorus are imagining what's going to happen to them when they when they get to Greece. Um, and so they start out. We have two choruses. Uh, or, sorry, we have, uh, we have the choruses broken up into individual speakers. So one says, I, I, heartbreaking are your lamentations. I'll sort of count up on my fingers so you can follow this, uh, which is going to get tough when it gets beyond five. But you know, you, you know what I mean? So, Never again shall I work my, sh my shuttle nimbly on a Trojan loom. For the last time I look on the graves of my parents, oh, for the last time. There's worse for me, much worse, first forced to lie in the bed of a Greek, the greatest nightmare of them all, or a female slave fetching water from Pyrenees' sacred spring in Corinth. And then it goes on to six, so I'm just going to keep counting on one finger, but add five. 
For me, I hope it's glorious Athens, never, never Sparta, Helen's damnable home where I'd have to look on Menelaus as master, that pillager of Troy. Then we get into the antistrophe, and it continues in the same way. There's lovely Thessaly, land of Peneus, at the foot of Mount Olympus, rich beyond all dreams, or so I've heard, fertile and fruitful in abundance. Let me go there, my second choice after glorious holy Athens. What about Etna, the domain of Hephaestus, and Sicily, the mother of mountains, which looks across to Phoenicia, famous, I'm told, for its faraway crown of challenging peaks? So now we're on to number 11 and 12, so just, again, add 10 now. And opposite, if you sail away over the Sea of Ionia, a place, uh, the pr sorry, a place the pretty water Crothis, the, the pretty river Crothis waters, sorry which turns your hair of flaming gold and nourishes a land of vigorous men. And then we have the news of Cassandra being dispersed to Agamemnon as a sex slave. So this strophe and antistrophe starts out with a lamentation for the loss of Troy, but then it's a, then there's a shift and they start thinking, you know, there are some some good places in Greece. Corinth would be nice. Athens would be nice. Um, Sicily would be nice. So there's that spark of hope. And then... Cut. When Cassandra is... Assigned as a sex slave. That hope is lost. It's crushed by the events. So this is basically what happens throughout the play, and basically Hecuba and the women are repeatedly battered by the forces of their defeat, I guess. Um, but what's really interesting about Hecuba is she actually never breaks. So even though there's a series of catastrophes that befall her, she remains dignified in a way that the Greek audience would have been very, very aware of. So, for instance, toward the end, she says, um, It is clear now the gods have singled me out for suffering and Troy for hate above all other cities. In vain have we slaughtered our hecatombs, and the divine reply is to bury us under the earth, heap it on us, pack it down, as if we were... We were to be smothered from view, unsung by the muses, unchanted, unrecorded in ages to come. Come, lift the dead onto his sad tomb, whatever is necessary has been done. Now that, not that the rites of funerals, in my opinion, have any interest for the dead. They are performed to satisfy the living. So that's interesting, because even in that sort of existential despair, she says, the rituals we do for the dead are for us. And the fact that she's she's decided to engage... So this is this is immediately after uh, they perform funeral ritual, rituals for Aspiritax, um, who was uh, Andromache's son. Sorry, I blanked on her name for just a second there who was Andromache's son, who was killed by the Greeks, thrown from the battlements of Troy so that he couldn't grow up to avenge his father's death and the destruction of his city. So they buried this child. I mean, we're talking like three, four years old here. So they buried this child. And yet Hecuba still says, I've done this for myself, for the living, because this is something, this is a way that we maintain ourselves. So that's really interesting. But then she gets, she gets more sort of dedicated, more stridently resistant. Um, at one point she says, and again, this is all very near the end of the play, after all of these catastrophes have happened. He says, O Troy, great city, once breadth of grandeur on the barbarian, seeing how fast your glory is extinct. They burn you down, and we, we are being herded off as slaves, O you gods. 
But why bother to invoke the gods in the past that never heard my prayers? So hurry, hurry into the flames, let my glory be to die in the bonfire of my home. So she attempts to commit basically ritual suicide. She, uh, she chooses death with honor in Troy rather than slavery in Greece. And for a Greek audience in the 5th century BCE, that would have been a very noble gesture, something that they would have recognized and something that they would have admired. Um, but she's prevented from entering uh, the burning city to die in it. But she still resists being made a slave. Um, her last lines of the play, she says, uh, Shake your silly shaking legs, Hecuba. Begin your walk toward your new life as slave. The chorus says, Sad, stricken Troy, farewell. We too must walk away to the Greek armada and set sail. But, and this is actually Paul Roche's um, editorial edition, uh, the, the final stage directions here, it says, as Troy continues to burn, Talthibius and his guards marshal the women of Troy and lead them off. Hecuba stands for a moment with bent head and her back to the city. Then she slowly begins to follow, but her footsteps get slower and slower till at last she sinks to the ground with her eyes riveted on the burning city. Several of the women run back to help her, but when they reach her, she is dead. So we've got so there's two ways, I think there's two ways to read this. One is the sort of final tragedy of Hecuba's death. I mean, she's this great sort of um, admirable, noble figure throughout the play, and she ends up dead. But the other way of reading this, which is the one that I choose to subscribe to, is that she denies the Greeks the right to take her as a slave. She denies their right to dispossess her of Troy, and she remains in Troy for eternity. 